Well, good morning, folks. Welcome to everyone here in the building and all those who are watching online on YouTube. Lots of folks are away on holiday this week, but the beauty of recording our services is that you can watch them from anywhere, anywhere there's a, an internet connection. So please do send me a postcard or a note from the places you are watching from, some exotic places like the Isle of Mull or, or wherever like that. You'll find my contact details in the description of the video on YouTube. Great news this week. We have a new granny in our congregation. Um, uh, Sam, uh, Ann Smart's son, uh, partner has given birth to a baby called Alice James. And we pray for that baby. He's going to have an operation tomorrow. So we continue to pray. But we rejoice at the birth of this child, a new addition to our family. We begin our worship with a new hymn, one that I hope that we'll be learning as we get back to singing in church. Let's stand as we worship God. The hymn is, O Great God of Highest Heaven. Please be seated. As we approach God, let's listen to a psalm that tells us who he is and what he has done for us. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As we go through the Sermon of the Mount, I am finding that there are a lot of things that Jesus says that strike home with me. He has some uncomfortable things to tell me about my own heart. And I wonder if you're feeling the same. Jesus is like a good doctor. 
He offers us a diagnosis of our problem before he offers us a cure. And yes, Jesus, the great physician, has the cure for all of our ills. But he asks us first to recognize the illness that needs healing. And our greatest problem as human beings is that we have sinned and we fall short of what God desires for us to be and to do. And so in the light of God's great love for us, as we begin our journey towards healing and our journey in worship this morning, we pray to acknowledge our sins. Let us pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. By your great love, set us free from a past that we cannot change and open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us your grace to grow more and more in your likeness and after your image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Lord God, in this service, we ask you to speak to us once again of that unfailing love. Give us hope for the future and strength to live these days that you have given us. And we pray now together the prayer that you taught all those who would follow you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. David is going to come and read for us our gospel reading this morning. David. This morning's reading is from Matthew, <clears throat> chapter 5, starting at verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Amen. Thank you, David. This is the time we usually have a children's talk. Um, I recorded the children's talk earlier in the week for obvious reasons, as you will see on the video. Um, let's watch that together. 
Today, I'd like to talk to you about anger. Do you ever get angry? Does anger just ever burst out of you? Let, let me tell you that sometimes I get angry. I get angry when things aren't going my way. I get angry when I mess up or someone else messes up. I get angry when I think someone is trying to boss me around or take advantage of me. Do you know why you get angry? Do you know where anger comes from? Anger is a feeling, the Bible says, that feelings, good and bad, come from our heart. It isn't wrong to feel angry. The Bible says that God sometimes gets angry. For instance, it's right to get angry when our planet is being destroyed by pollution or greenhouse gases. It's right to get angry when we see children being hurt in war. There are all sorts of good reasons to be angry. And it is natural to be angry in a messed up world like we live in. What can be wrong, though, is the way that we deal with our anger. Sometimes we get angry because we literally bottle up our feeling of anger. Somebody might do something that annoys or hurts us and we don't say anything. The other person might keep on doing that thing that annoys or hurts. And because we didn't say anything, we get angrier and angrier until what happens? Yes, that's right, we explode. How can we prevent exploding with anger? Let me show you. I'm doing this here in my garden because it's too messy to do in church and I'm wearing this protective gear as well. You know about Mintos and Diet Coke. I've got two bottles here. One I haven't opened yet, and the other I've left the lid off. I've left it off all day. And here's what happens when we bottle up our anger. Okay. The other person does something that annoys us or is hurtful. That's what the Mentos stand for. Something that annoys us or is a hurtful thing. Okay, we'll put that in there. Oh, yeah! That just happened. If we put in even more, it keeps going and going and going. And if we had put the lid on, it would have exploded, wouldn't it? That's what happens when we try to bottle things up. But what about the bottle with the open lid? The bottle with the, the lid off represents for me a, a follower of Jesus, someone who is open to God, someone who knows that they have messed up when it comes to the way that God expects us to live. They recognize that Jesus died on the cross to forgive them. And daily they're saying to God, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. And I want you to help me live a better way. The bottle with the lid off also represents for me a follower of Jesus who doesn't bottle up their anger towards other people. If someone does something that annoys them, they go to that person right away and they say to the person in the most, in the nicest possible way, hey, you know what you did? That really makes me feel annoyed or that really makes me feel hurt. It really makes me feel angry. The other person might not have even realized what they have done and they might apologize right away. Ooh, it's fizzing, but it's not bursting over, is it? even though there are two of them in there. Because the lid off person understands that God forgives them, 
they're able to forgive other people and not explode with anger. Sure, they might do other things to fix the situation, like tell mom or dad, but they're not going to explode with anger and maybe end up doing something back to the person that is just as annoying and just as hurtful. Let's be like this bottle. Let's remember what God did for us so that we can be forgiven. Let's daily take the lid off of our hearts and let God look inside. Let's ask God for forgiveness for what's, what isn't right there in our hearts. And let's ask him to help us to do better. And let's be willing to forgive others and not make exploding messes whenever someone does something that hurts or annoys. Well, those dogs are being a bit annoying, <laughs> but that was fine. I don't know if you know of the origins of the word opportunity. It comes from the Latin ob and portus, towards the port, towards land. It's a nautical term. We're going to have a, a song now, Jesus Be the Center. And then it, it, it speaks of God being the wind in our sails. God wants to get us headed towards the port, but we need to put up our sails and let him be the wind in our sails. Let's listen to this hymn, Jesus Be the Center. pray together as we turn to reflect on God's word. Lord, your light is always shining. Your fire is always burning. The wind of your spirit is always blowing. Help us to come near, to be in a place where we can be warmed by that fire. 
Help us to turn that we can see that light and reflect it clearly. Help us to put up those sails so that we can sail in the direction you would take us. Lord, as we turn to reflect on your word, we ask for your spirit to come and inspire. Inspire my words and our hearing. For Jesus' sake, amen. Last week, we looked at all of verses 21 to 48 of Matthew's chapter 5 of Matthew's gospel. And we recognize there that in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us six examples of how he wants his disciples to approach God and God's laws. In each of these examples, Jesus first cites how we and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law normally approach God's law. And then Jesus goes on to show his listeners a better way. Not an easier way, but a better way. And we observed last week that according to the gospel, for everyone, no matter how good and upstanding we are, the law is a mirror that shows us that we have failed to live up to God's standards. But when we accept that we can't fulfill God's righteous demands, when we accept Christ as our Savior, God's law becomes a delight and a help in living this life with joy and with freedom. This truth is foundational. And unless we get this truth right, that we need a Savior, the law of God will continue to frustrate us, and it will be nothing but a burden that is impossible to carry. But thank God that he has given us a Savior. Now this Sunday, we go on to dig deeper into the first of the six examples that Jesus gives us in living as a disciple. Living out of that place of having been forgiven and accepted, but still needing to be changed from the inside out. And that's the third use of the law of God that we identified last week. Being changed by this law under grace. Now take a look at your Bibles if you have it. In Matthew 5, beginning at verse 21, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. You have heard that it was said long ago. It's not the usual way Jesus would use for quoting the Old Testament. In other places in the Gospels, when he is referring to an Old Testament text, Jesus says, it is written. And here, Jesus is quoting the sixth commandment from Exodus 20. But he's doing more than that. He is also quoting what others have said about the sixth commandment commandment, what the people have heard from long ago. In Exodus 20, it doesn't have, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. It's not there in Exodus 20. That is something that the tradition they have heard adds on to the commandment. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it is true. In ancient Israel, people would, according to God's law, be prosecuted in law if they murdered. They would be subject to judgment, just as it is in every society today. And Jesus is not contradicting this. But what Jesus says in the rest of the paragraph turns everything upside down. Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister 
will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or a sister, Racha, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. Now, by way of explanation, you probably have a footnote to this effect in your Bible. But the Aramaic word that goes untranslated here, Racha, means empty-headed. And the word for court here in the text is Sanhedrin, which was the highest court in the Israelite community. Now, murder is a very serious crime. <clears throat> I think we would all agree. But Jesus seems to be saying that <clears throat> being angry at and calling a brother or sister empty-headed or a fool is even more serious than murder. Look at the passage. Murder entails being judged. Being angry also, according to Jesus, entails judgment. But calling a brother or a sister empty-headed may land you before the highest court in the land. And calling a brother or sister a fool or a moron may very well get you eternal punishment. In Jesus' words, there is a kind of escalation here. And what would we would see as the lesser infringement gets the greater punishment. Calling someone a fool, in my book at least, is nowhere near as bad as murder. What is Jesus getting at here? How can it be that calling someone a fool gets you in more trouble than murder? Well, I think Jesus is being intentionally provocative. Jesus, like in so many other places, is trying to get us to think. In God's eyes, we've learned that sin is sin, and there are no degrees as to which is going to get you more severe punishment. All sin, according to Scripture, deserves death. What I think Jesus is trying to help us to understand that we see... What I think Jesus is doing is trying to help us to understand that we see... As a mirror, a, a, a minor fault has great and eternal ramifications. Notice that Jesus doesn't give any commandments here. Jesus doesn't say, thou shalt not be angry. And he doesn't say, thou shalt not call a brother or sister raka or fool. That is, however, how we read what is written here, don't we? I mean, if, if something may land you in hell, that is surely something that shouldn't be done. In my tr Bible translation, there's a heading for this passage, this whole passage that says quite simply, murder. And although Jesus mentions murder at the beginning, the true subject of this paragraph it seems to me, is anger. And calling a brother or a sister empty-headed or a fool are, are merely hurtful expressions of that anger. So anger, it seems, is the subject of this paragraph. Now let me ask you a question. Is being angry always wrong? Of course it isn't. In the Bible, at times, God is angry, and God isn't ever wrong. God is justifiably angry at injustice, abuse, oppression, and he is angry whenever human beings rebel against his just decrees. Anger, however, is not a basic characteristic of God like love is. God's anger is a reaction to evil. 
When evil is done away with, God will no longer ever be angry. No matter what happens in the world, God is always love. That is a basic characteristic, characteristic and wrath and, and anger are not. Okay, that's God. But what about us? Is our anger ever justified? Of course it is. In the same way God gets angry at injustice, so should we. In the Greek New Testament, there are two words for anger. There is the word thumoi, which is often translated rage. It's a flying off of the handle uncontrollably. And according to Scripture, rage is never justifiable for obvious reasons. Paul in Galatians calls it a work of the flesh as opposed to those wonderful fruits of the spirit. Thumoi is never justified because it violates that most underrated fruit of self-control. The other word for anger in the Greek is the word that is used here in our passage. It is the word orgizo. Now, orgizo can be justified or unjustified anger. More often than not, I find in my own experience, my orgizo is unjustified. Confession time here. I have always had a problem with anger. And I think it's partly to do with my personality type, but that is no excuse. My personality type is that I'm a pioneer, a reformer, I'm a perfectionist. And when things don't go my way, I get angry. And more often than not, I get angry more at myself than I do at others. But that's me. In our passage, Jesus doesn't say whether the anger mentioned here is justified righteous anger or whether it is unjustified, unrighteous anger. It could be either. I think that that is an important point for us to hear. Even righteous anger can lead us down the wrong path. It is how we deal with anger. Any anger, righteous or unrighteous, that Jesus is most concerned about for his disciples in our passage this morning. Now, what does murder have to do with anger? Why does Jesus link these two things, murder and anger, together here in our text? Well, the answer is that they have been linked together from the beginning of time. Genesis chapter 4 is the account of the first murder, and it's no coincidence that it's also the place where anger is first mentioned in the Bible. You remember the story. Cain and Abel are brothers. Cain's an arable farmer, and Abel keeps sheep. They both gave offerings to God in thanksgiving for, thanksgiving for all that he had given to both of them. But for some reason, God was more pleased with Abel's offering than he was with Cain's. Cain gets angry. He doesn't get angry at Abel, I think, but he gets angry at God. And God realizes that something is not right with Cain, and so God goes directly to Cain and he gives Cain this advice. He asks him, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? There's still a chance for Cain, still a choice to make. But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door, 
It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain, you're angry. Angry is a feeling. Feelings of anger let you know that something is amiss. Feelings of anger let you know that something is amiss either in your own heart or in the world around you, or indeed in, in both. That anger that you feel could very well be justified. But the important thing, Cain and Mike, is how are you going to handle that anger? What are you going to do with your anger? That anger of yours, Cain and Mike, can be dangerous. It can be really, really dangerous. Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, God doesn't tell Cain not to be angry. He says to him, do what is right. Resist the temptation to let this feeling lead you into sin. Later, the apostle Paul will say, be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Jesus knew the power of anger. But Jesus also knew the infinite value of human beings. Jesus knew that anger can lead us to the sin of writing people off as worthless, empty-headed, fool, moron, our ways of saying to a brother or sister, you are worthless to me. And this, according to Jesus, we must never say, or even more importantly, we must never believe. Even though Cain wasn't angry at Abel, Cain's anger still led him to see his brother's life as worthless. And it led him to murder his own brother. And in the end, Cain's sad reply to God's subsequent question about the whereabouts of his brother echoed down the annals of history. Am I my brother's keeper? And the resounding answer that God gives is, yes, Cain. Yes, you are. For every human being is made in my image. Therefore, every human being is priceless. Jesus goes on to give two thought-provoking scenarios that describe how it is he wants us to deal with situations where relationships have broken down, broken down through anger and perhaps because of other causes too. Jesus sees this as inevitable. The main point being that another person is precious and it's worth doing all you can to be reconciled to them. The first scenario is about offering a gift at the altar. Now we, so removed from the original cultural context, might assume that what Jesus is talking about is, is putting a few coins in the offering plate in the local parish church, something we can't do at the moment in, in the, this present situation we find ourselves in. But putting a few coins in the offering plate in the local parish church is not the picture of what is happening here. In Jesus' day, there was only one altar, to offer a sacrifice on any other altar, even at the local parish church, was seen as something akin to devil worship. Jesus speaking to these folks in Galilee, way up in the north of the country, is talking about their annual pilgrimages to Jerusalem to offer not just a few coins, but 
10% of their crop or a whole goat or a whole bull. Something that these folks would have spent the whole year getting ready to sacrifice. Something that precious, that valuable. Going to the altar in Jerusalem was a trek of 90-some miles. And it it would have taken three or four days to get there. So here Jesus is saying, if you make this annual pilgrimage and you get to the altar with your goat and you suddenly remember that your brother or sister has something against you, then drop everything. Leave that precious gift at the altar and run 90 kilometers home. Get reconciled with your brother or sister and then run 90 kilometers back and make your sacrifice. Reconciliation with others is that important. Please note that in this scenario, a brother or sister has something against you. It is they who are angry at you for some reason. Jesus is is saying, be so concerned that their anger might lead them into sin that you will go to these lengths to spare them from that yes Jesus says you are your sister's keeper even that annoying sister who is so easily offended and so easily annoyed at you Now, Jesus says nothing about the more likely, the the more than likely scenario that the brother or sister might not want to be reconciled with you. Well, of course, you can't control that. But you can do all you can do to put things right. Later, Paul will give this advice. If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And that brings us to the last scenario. And I must admit, this one makes me scratch my head a bit. This scenario involves not a brother or sister, but an adversary, an enemy. Even so, Jesus is saying that reconciliation is worth it. The alternative to reconciliation is hell on earth. Endless litigation. If you've ever been involved in the judicial process, even in a relatively just society like ours, it will invariably end up costing you more than if you had settled in the first place. I don't think there's anything more to this scenario than that. I don't think that Jesus is giving us a literal prescription for how we're to approach litigation in the courts. The main point, again, is that reconciliation with brothers and sisters and even enemies, is of the highest order. But why? Why is his disciples being reconciled with others so important to Jesus? Well, it's because his disciples, you and me, we represent him. And he wants us to reflect him in the way that we live and we live with one another. In Christ, God came to reconcile human beings to himself. That is what the cross is all about. That is what God is all about. That is God. He's a reconciler. And we, his disciples, are 
people who have experienced his reconciling work in our lives. God wants us to be agents of that reconciliation in the world by telling people about it, yes, but also by showing the difference that it can make in our lives. In our life together as a community of faith, as a church, as a Christian family, as brothers and sisters, but also in our life with others, even with our enemies. Folks, can I be clear? This is not easy. And I know, I know Jesus is speaking to me as much, if not more, than he's speaking to others. It might be easy to say that reconciliation is of the highest order, but it is hard to do. And I know that you have been hurt by others. I myself have been deeply hurt by what others have said and done to me here in bigger and elsewhere in my life. But Christ's call is that I try as best I can, relying on the power of his spirit to be reconciled to those who have hurt me or those whom I have hurt. It's not easy, but it is possible. But it is only possible when we practice it become disciplined at it, work together at it as a family, holding each other accountable for it, playing the role of peacemakers for each other and amongst each other. But most of all, reconciliation, living like this, is only possible when we rely on the grace and the forgiveness of our God. And that he gives us in spades. May God help us as we learn to manage our anger and as we attempt to be reconciled to others. May God help us to live into that kingdom that he has promised us as we stand open to him and open to the people with whom we deal day by day. Our hymn of response is a hymn that was recorded by Staff McLeod and the Praise Gathering Choir, a choir that usually meets yearly here in Scotland but hasn't been able to meet in person, and so they meet virtually online. This is a beautiful hymn, His Mercy is More.
begin our prayers with a quote from a well-known Christmas carol. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what can I give him? Give him my heart. Lord God, we are not particularly poor nor is any of us particularly wise. But from each of us, you desire the same thing, that we give you our hearts. Take what we offer here, Lord. Take our offerings, our efforts, and our hearts. Bless them all that in your blessing each may abound to your glory and the furtherance of your kingdom here and bigger and throughout the world. Loving God, you have reconciled us in Christ Jesus and you have given us the ministry of reconciliation. So now we pray for a broken world where men and Women and whole nations are at war with one another. We pray specifically for the countries of South Sudan and Haiti this morning. We rejoice with the people of South Sudan as they celebrate 10 years of nationhood this last week. Lord, you know it has not been a trouble-free 10 years. We ask you that by the work of your spirit through your people in that place and beyond, 
of the next 10 years for that nation will be marked by peace and blessing. We also pray for the nation of Haiti this morning, reeling as they are from the assassination of their elected leader, even in the midst of trying to recover from so many natural and man-made disasters. Lord God, bring healing with hope to Haiti. Empower your people in that island nation to boldly proclaim your good news, even in the face of so much bad news. We pray for ourselves. We pray for all those from whom we individually are estranged at the moment. Bring healing to strained or broken relationships. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have wronged others, whether by ignorance, neglect, or intention. Grant us the courage and the grace to seek their forgiveness. Give us opportunities to make amends. And where others have wronged us, grant us a gracious spirit that we might forgive it, even as we have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we pray for our church family, for folks who have needs at the moment, for a sister who has had a diagnosis of an illness, for baby Alice and his whole family, for others who are going through hard times just now. Lord, we ask you to assure them of your presence with them that if they have nothing else, they have you, and that is the most important thing to have. Hold them in the palm of your hand. Bring healing and wholeness, we pray. We pray these prayers in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake, amen. Our final hymn is a well-known one, the hymn, To Be a Pilgrim, because that is what we're doing. We're pilgrimaging to God and in his way. Let's stand for this final hymn. How great thou art. Sorry. My script is wrong.
Let's receive God's blessing. Brothers and sisters, be angry, but do not sin. Rather, go knowing that God has reconciled you to himself through Christ. Be agents, therefore, of reconciliation in your homes, in our community, and in God's world. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain with us all evermore. Amen.